Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. As requested, as part of a Halloween run, today we're finally doing a deep dive of Guillermo del Toro's Hellboy 2, The Golden Army. Set a few years after the first film, in this sequel, the border separating our world from mythic realms become perilously thin when ancient grievances threaten to kickstart a war. Prince Nuada, an exiled elven prince, returns from obscurity with a vengeful agenda, aiming to rally the mystical forces against humanity. His ace in the hole, the legendary Golden Army, a dormant battalion of unyielding mechanical warriors that, once awakened by a magical crown, could tip the scales of power irrevocably. Enter Hellboy, the Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense's most unconventional asset, and his team, as they navigate through a clandestine world filled with enchanting markets, treacherous prophecies, and age-old conflicts. Juxtaposed against the vivid backdrop of ancient lore and contemporary challenges, Del Toro's narrative not only showcases epic battles and monsters, but also delves into personal dilemmas and the intricacies of love, loyalty, and legacy. The Kaleidoscope Ride fuses the whimsical elements of fairy tales with the hard-edged realities of a world where the extraordinary and the everyday intertwine. And in this video, we're going to do our best to explore the story, the characters, the Golden Army warriors and tooth fairies, and the production of one of the best comic book sequels of all time. I will never open that door! <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> On a nostalgic Christmas Eve in 1955, young Hellboy, with the innocence of youth embodied by Monza Rebe, eagerly anticipates a nighttime fable from his guardian, Professor Brew, a role captured with poignancy by John Hurt. Transporting us back to a time of ancient disputes, the tale unfurls, a cosmic battle rages between the mundane realm of humans and the fantastical denizens of a magical domain. At the dawn of time, man, beast, and all magical beings live together under Aegis. Desperate to save his realm, the elven monarch, King Baelor, commissioned the Golden Army. The formidable battalion comprising of 4,900 mystical automatons were designed to heed only to the command of whoever wore the crown, essentially making its wielder the most powerful individual on Earth. Standing much taller than an average human, these soldiers are meticulously crafted, with an intricate design reminiscent of ancient armors, but infused with a clockwork intricacy. Made of a golden, almost brass-like material, they have a steampunk aesthetic combined with an otherworldly, eldritch energy. Inside these soldiers, there's no flesh, blood, or bone. They're entirely mechanical, animated by mysterious magical force. The most remarkable feature of these soldiers is their ability to self-repair. When broken apart, they can reassemble themselves in mere moments, effectively making them indestructible. Their sheer size, combined with their mechanical nature, endows them with formidable strength, far surpassing that of a human or most magical creatures. They do not know fear, hesitation, or mercy. Their singular focus is to follow the directive given by their commander, which often results in overwhelming force and devastation. But it's just a story. Those guys, they can't be real. Well, my son, I'm sure you'll find out. It's no surprise, then, that in a Shakespearean twist, after seeing the tragedy and unstoppable slaughter his machines were responsible for, King Baelor, drowning in remorse, extends an olive branch. Now the human race would reign over urban realms, while the elves, in a self-imposed exile, would reside harmoniously in the verdant embrace of the woods. As a testament to this accord, Baelor divides his mighty crown, two for the elves and one for mankind. Yet, as with every epic, there's a dissenting voice. Prince Nuada, Baylor's own progeny, sees not compromise, but capitulation. The prince's bitterness over the truce and his disappearance, juxtaposed against his sister, Princess Nuala's acceptance, teases a familial divide between conforming and seeking peace, or rebelling and demanding justice. Eschewing the peace, Nuada disappears into the shadows as a prince in waiting. This truce would be honored until the end of time. But Prince Nuada did not believe in the promises of man. Fast forwarding a few centuries to the present, the luxury of Tarnas' fine auctions is disrupted by the re-emergence of Prince Muada. He's not here for a mere spectacle. He seeks the human fragment of the ancient crown to command the Golden Army, and this interruption is not just a display of strength, but a proclamation of intent. Nuada is basically disillusioned by the magical world's declining state under humanity's reign. For him, the crown and its power aren't mere artifacts, but tools to restore the natural order. Proud, empty, hollow things that you are! Let this remind you why you once feared the dark. Masterfully portrayed by Luke Goss, Nuada is joined by the behemoth Mr. Wink, played with captivating menace by Brian Steele, who proves that his loyalty knows no bounds. With intentions as clear as his alabaster skin, 
Nuada claims the fragment and, in a move straight out of mythology, summons creatures of old to ensure humanity remembers its past. Within the hallowed walls of the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense, a tale as old as bureaucracy itself unfolds. A meeting between the no-nonsense agent Tom Manning, given gravitas by Jeffrey Tambor, and the cryptic Abe Sapien, brought to life by Doc Jones. Manning's beef? Hellboy's penchant for stepping into the limelight when the BPRD's motto is more akin to fighting monsters and staying undercover. Undercover? Can't he get the meaning of the word? Look, and he posed for this one and gave an autograph. Through the Bureau, the film tackles a continuous balancing act between the supernatural and the mundane, humanity and the other. Here, Hellboy, Liz Sherman and Abe Sapien are more than mere agents. They symbolize different facets of the non-human trying to find a place in a human-centric world. Hellboy's struggles are evident. Raised by humans, he grapples with his demonic identity, seeking acceptance. His tumultuous relationship with Liz is a manifestation of these challenges. On the other hand, Liz, a woman wielding fiery power, is Hellboy's anchor. She's protective, yet conflicted, especially given her undisclosed secret. Abe Sapien stands apart as a calm, logical entity, but even he cannot escape the emotional whirlwind for long. Ever the insightful fishman, he deduces that love troubles with the fiery Liz might be fanning Hellboy's rebellious flames. And as our paranormal protagonists arrive at the auction house, Manning, attempting diplomacy, or more likely bribery, gives Hellboy some Cuban cigars in a last-ditch plea for discretion. Like a shadow in the night. But discretion, it seems, isn't in today's cards. The aftermath at the auction house paints a dark tableau. 70 attendees and not a soul in sight. Abe Sleuthing unveils a most curious suspect, diminutive winged menaces known as tooth fairies. Feed mostly on calcium, bones, skin, organs, but they do go for the teeth first. Hailing from the picturesque Black Forest of Germany, the tooth fairies aren't your grandmother's quarter for a tooth under the pillow type. No, these tiny terrors with a taste for calcium are the dreaded nightmare of every dental hygienist. One might argue they're simply on a quest for a balanced diet. However, they're not merely satisfied with a toothy appetizer. They'd rather feast on the whole buffet from flesh to bone till there's naught but unsightly droppings left. Interestingly, for all their frenzy, these fairies bear intelligence and the capacity for communication, albeit not in English, but their native underworld tongue. Amidst the investigation, Abe's psychic senses tingle, not from impending danger, but from sensing Liz's budding motherhood. But such personal revelations are quickly overshadowed by an onslaught of the aforementioned calcium-craving critters. Liz, in a blaze of maternal instinct, tortures the tiny terrors, culminating in Hellboy's inadvertent public appearance. And voila, the BPRD's once clandestine existence is now front-page news. What have you done? Guess we're out. Hey, Hellboy, over here! Hellboy, Hellboy. Parallel to this, Prince Nuadu and his hulking sidekick, Mr. Wink, are called to a regal rendezvous with King Baylor, portrayed with authority by Roy Dotris, who advocates for the continued truce with humans. His daughter, the ethereal Nuala, a captivating Anna Walton, concurs. However, Prince Nuada, ever the skeptic, deems humanity a ticking time bomb for all things mystical. And he's not wrong. The humans have forgotten the gods, destroyed the earth. Greed has burned a hole in their heart that will never be filled. They will never have enough. In a twist of ironic voyeurism, Hellboy lounges, soaking in the evening news, where he's the lead story. Reveling in his newfound celebrity status, he finds the attention tantalizingly appealing. What about this guy, walking around with a toilet seat on his head? <laughs> it's a breathing apparatus. Liz, on the other hand, who is taking a pregnancy test, is less amused. For her, the public eye isn't a spotlight, but a glaring flashlight, scrutinizing their every move. The ever-officious Tom Manning adds fuel to the fire, forewarning Hellboy of a gift from Washington, a new BPRD agent thanks to Hellboy's latest escapade into fame. You have brought this unto yourself. Washington is sending down a new BPRD agent. A new guy? Meanwhile, in a supernatural realm, King Baylor and Prince Nuada exchange heated words. Nuada's unwavering stance on safeguarding the magical realm from humanity culminates in his act of patricide. With the crown piece in his grasp, the chase is on for the final fragment, safeguarded by the fleeing Princess Nuala. Here, her brother emerges not just as a villain, but as a character with a sympathetic motivation. His dedication to his people and his anger at humanity's neglect of the Earth gives Hellboy much to think about with regards to his own role at the BPRD as a monster hunter. And his relationship with his twin sister Nuala, especially their psychic link, reveals his softer side, creating a complex character that the audience can empathize with even if we don't agree with his methods. 
Evidently, this guy's quite the big shot in Washington. What's his name? His name is Johann Krauss. Back at the BPRD, the anticipation for the new agent is tangible. Enter Johann Krauss, a character less human and more of a vessel for ectoplasmic whimsy, buoyed by the unmistakable distinct tones of Seth MacFarlane. Johann Krauss's introduction to the team is noteworthy, a disembodied spirit contained within a suit. Krauss is both a source of comic relief and a foil to Hellboy. His by-the-book approach to leadership is diametrically opposed to Hellboy's impulsiveness, and their conflicting methodologies underscore a central theme of the movie, the tension between order and chaos, rules and rebellion. In a science meets sorcery move, Krauss breathes ephemeral life into a deceased tooth fairy, and the creature's ancient tongue reveals a lead, the troll market, folklore's best kept secret, rumored to be nestled beneath the Brooklyn Bridge. It seems our little friend here remembers market sounds and voices. The troll market. Donning time dilation glasses, a chic blend of fashion and function, the team become privy to the arcane and spot a troll named Fragglewump, who is forced to act as their unwitting guide to the troll market's entrance. As Hellboy steps into this fantastical bazaar, it's a breath of fresh air, a place where he can rub shoulders with the bazaar and not feel like the odd one out, because here, oddity is the norm. The troll market sequence is a visual and narrative marvel. Beneath the city's mundane facade, a magical world thrives. It's chaotic yet ordered, foreign yet familiar. The market isn't just a location, but a representation of the magical world's heartbeat. Amidst the hustle and bustle of the troll market, Abe's astute eyes catch a glimmer of regal intrigue. Following the trail of a hooded figure sporting a familiar royal seal, he discovers it's not just a fashion statement, it's Princess Nuala. Your father left you this map. In it lies the secret of the Golden Army. She's effectively here for some royal library checkout, a cylinder her father deemed worthy of hiding. And when their paths cross, it's a psychic dance, a meeting of minds without words, only gestures. But it's not long until Mr. Wink interrupts their connection with Braun and not much else. As Abe plays a chivalrous knight, urging Nuala to safety, Hellboy throws down with Wink. It's here in a debrief with Nuala that the team learns of the last piece of the royal crown and a map to the Golden Army. Krauss, ever the by-the-book character, hesitates to involve the princess further, but Hellboy, with his penchant for bending rules, pushes back. Unfortunately for them, seeking vengeance for his fallen comrade, Prince Nuada pulls out his secret weapon, a seemingly innocuous seed. But what grows isn't your typical houseplant, it's a forest elemental, and the last of its kind. Kill him. It's just a jumping bee. The appearance of this colossal green menace prompts Hellboy to swap his iconic Samaritan for the more robustly named Big Baby, a grenade launcher with attitude. The battle rages, and amidst the chaos, Hellboy's heroic instincts shine as he rescues a baby from the towering terror. Yet in the aftermath, as the elemental's blood springs new life onto the earth, the crowd isn't cheering, they're jeering, calling a red freak, and condemning the very hero who just saved one of their own. Oh, what have you done to my baby? Baby's fine. You freak! In a more somber moment, a wounded Hellboy seeks solace, but Liz, his fiery confidant, adds to his confusion hinting at needing space. The crux of their emotional standoff? Liz wants to know where Hellboy's loyalties lie, with the world's fickle applause or with her unwavering heart. Despite their shared experiences and intimate bond, the two struggle with the complexities of love and commitment in a world where they hunt those that they have more in common with than humanity, and his reckless behavior, fueled by a desire to be accepted by the public, creates further friction. On the other hand, her pregnancy becomes the axis around which their personal narrative revolve, with Liz grappling with the implications of bringing a child into their chaotic world. Red, why are you with me? Do you need everyone to like you? Everybody? Or am I enough? What I love about this movie is that parallel to Hellboy and Liz's tumultuous relationship is Abe Sapien's growing infatuation with Princess Nuala. Here Del Toro paints Abe's love as innocent and profound. Having spent most of his life in the confines of the BPRD, his encounter with Nuala is a journey of self-discovery, their shared psychic abilities further intertwine their destinies, providing a mirror to the physical realm's connections through supernatural threads. Abe's infatuation with Nuala reaches its zenith. Their psychic connection allows him insights into her emotions and fears, fostering a deeper understanding. But this connection is a double-edged sword, as it also means he feels the pain and anguish Nuala experiences because of her twin's actions. 
The bond further cements Abe's determination to protect her, but also amplifies his internal conflict when choosing between his duty to the BPRD and his growing affection for the princess. You look different. Oh, do I? Perhaps my hair? No, it's your eyes. Unfortunately, when Nuala reveals her psychic sibling bond with her brother to A, the location of BPRD headquarters is compromised. As a precautionary gesture, she tucks away the third crown fragment within the sanctuary of Abe's bibliophilic world. Meanwhile, in a classic locker room showdown, Hellboy and Kraus spar verbally. Kraus, confidently laying out his argument, states that if the two were ever to get into a tiff, the odds would favor him because of Hellboy's hot-headedness. And Red, ever the predictable hero, responds not with words but with his fists, leading to an epic Lockers vs Hellboy wrestling match orchestrated by Kraus's ethereal abilities. <laughs> Enter a love-struck Abe, swaying to heart-throbbing ballads, clearly smitten by Princess Nuala. Hellboy, in his own blundering way, joins the emotional rendezvous. A brooding session about love ensues, which gets juicier as Abe teeters on revealing Liz's secret, before a furious Liz interrupts, not pleased with their inebriated introspection. But the drama doesn't end here. Nuada, not one to sit idle, stages a break-in, grabbing both the map to the Golden Army and his beloved sister. Ever the dramatic villain, he leaves a threatening psychic message for Abe and delivers a literal stab to Hellboy using a cursed spear. You may have mused in the past. Am I mortal? You are now. Nuada's abduction of Nuala sets the stage for the final act. His ultimatum to the BPRD, the last piece of the crown in exchange for Nuala's life, is not just a plot device, but a moral quandary. The decision isn't black and white. Saving Nuala could potentially doom the world, yet leaving her to her fate is unthinkable, especially to Wabe. The medical team at BPRD are also left stumped as attempts to extract the spear only push it perilously closer to Hellboy's heart. As the dust settles, an astute Abe discovers the crown piece, and the remnants of King Baylor's map reveal the Golden Army was located in Northern Ireland. The landscape, drenched in history and folklore, provides the perfect backdrop for this phase of their quest. The lush greenery, ancient relics, and subtle infusion of magic in the air symbolize a bridge between the known world and the arcane. Promptly arriving there, the team are approached by a goblin with a penchant for shiny things. Spotting the gleaming spearhead peeking out of Hellboy's wound, he strikes a deal, lead them to the Golden Army in exchange for the spear in return. Taking a detour, they're then greeted by the Angel of Death, portrayed hauntingly by Doug Jones, who drops a bombshell. Saving Hellboy may doom the world, with Liz having to bear the brunt of that fallout. Make a choice, the world or him. him. But love conquers all, and after an emotionally charged moment, Liz drops her own revelation. Hellboy Jr. is on the way, news of which not only revives Hellboy, but also leaves him gobsmacked. With the weight of future fatherhood upon him, Hellboy's journey now isn't just about saving the world anymore, it becomes about creating a world fit for his progeny. The story converges toward an explosive showdown when the team, guided by their shifty goblin, reaches the central chamber of the Golden Army. Nuada's presence is both a challenge and a mirror, like Hellboy is driven by a purpose, albeit a starkly contrasting one. And their standoff isn't merely physical, it's the clashing of two ideologies, one striving for coexistence, the other for dominance over humanity. In a not-so-surprising move, unwilling to let go of the princess, Abe hands over the crown in exchange for Nuala, enabling Nuada to activate the mechanical monstrosities. In an epic climactic showdown, Hellboy and co. face off against the invincible Golden Army, gilded warriors that simply repair themselves when they're destroyed. And with victory seeming impossible, always won for dramatic flair, Red issues a royal challenge to Nuada as a Nung Rama, the offspring of the Fallen One. As the duel escalates across the chamber, our hellish hero gets the edge but takes the high road, sparing Nuada. Just when we think chivalry's made a comeback, the prince aims for a sneaky hit and is stopped by Nuala, who sacrifices her life to stop her brother's tyranny and save Hellboy, causing both siblings to fade to stone like their father before them. Hellboy, technically the last prince standing, now faces the Golden Crown's allure. Luckily, before he can be corrupted by its power, Liz swiftly intervenes, melting the crown and saving the world from another monarchy. All that power. Don't even think about it. The BPRD backup brigade, led by a clearly overworked Manning, finally arrive. But before their boss is able to unload his managerial fury, 
Hellboy, Liz and Abe hand over their badges and quit confronting the bureaucratic structure they've been a part of. Their collective resignation signals a move away from structured duty to personal agency, while Johann Krauss, ever the wildcard, chooses solidarity over protocol, a subtle yet significant character development for him. As our story concludes, Hellboy muses on a quiet domestic life when Liz drops the mother of all revelations. She's expecting twins. Red, who's always grappled with his identity and purpose, now has a clear path, that of a protector and a father. Let's find a place in the country. Clean air, green hills, a yard. But after Pan's Labyrinth, I said, well, you know, let's lose the hair, let's let the hair loose. And these guys uh, gave me a green light to essentially anything I imagined. Del Toro is undoubtedly a master of the creature feature. Some might draw parallels with Pixar's mastermind, John Lasseter. But where Lasseter's universe is bathed in golden sunlight and apple pies, Del Toro's is cloaked in twilight, echoing hints of his Mexican Catholic roots. Legend whispers of a grandmother who made him wear bottle tops in his shoes, a punishment or perhaps an eccentric ritual aiming to keep his feet firmly grounded despite a head teeming with monsters. Clearly she suspected something devilish afoot that would grow into a fascination with creatures that borders on the romantic. For me, what makes a director's foray into the mythical so compelling is that he finds authenticity in his imagined abysses. His brilliance lies in crafting multi-layered characters, whether they're humanoid, timber, metal, or mineral, each endowed with heart, tangible flaws, goals, and motivations. The movie is considerably bigger, but he's kept it anchored in character and story. Guillermo is interested in parables. He's interested in parallel universes, and he's interested in telling a story in a fantastical world. He's a little boy with this humongous imagination. He has a way of being able to help people go back to being children. At first glance, Hellboy seems like a half-baked inferno, constantly caught between his hellish heritage and his affection for the mundanities of humanity. But that's a surface-level take. Look closer and you see a creature embroiled in the most human of battles, the identity crisis, and the pursuit of purpose. He's got a destiny bigger than any mortal man, but he'd trade it for a six-pack and a good fight. And while his fiery tail and propensity to get into bureaucratic scrapes might make you chuckle, his internal struggle, trying to reconcile the demonic destiny pulsating within his blood with his longing for a normal life and acceptance, carries the very crux of the narrative. It's almost tragic to think that this demon yearns more for humanity than most humans. It is an extraordinary film that makes you remember what it's like to have an imagination. This is why I get into it. I mean, you know, this is Hamlet and King Lear, all those things you know, rolled into one. If there's one actor who was born to play the character, it's Ron Perlman, who embodies every smirk and sarcastic quip. It's like the pages of Mike Manola's comic book springing to life. Perlman perfectly balances the hard exterior of a seasoned demon fighter with the vulnerable heart of a troubled romantic, a dash of world weariness, a sprinkle of childlike glee, and you've got a recipe for a protagonist that's both relatable and awe-inspiring. It's not just the horns and the tail, it's the way he carries himself. He's a right blend of swagger, strength, size, and sorrow, and every punch, both emotional and physical, hits home. Look at her. She's it, babe. She's it. She's my whole wide world. You know? He says you're rude, brutish, but not very bright. Wow. Liz Sherman, always on the brink, is a time bomb wrapped in human complexity. Being the literal embodiment of the phrase, playing with fire, she represents a chaotic force of nature, but she's much more than her fiery facade. With the revelation of her impending motherhood, we're offered a stark and vulnerable glimpse into the fragile humanity that resides within her. This is juxtaposed beautifully with her role as Hellboy's anchor, a beacon of stability and understanding, trying to ground a partner who's perpetually on the edge. Selma Blair has always had this understated strength about her, and it shines in Hellboy 2 more than ever. There's a quiet fire in her that mirrors the explosive one she wields as Liz. Watching her navigate the complexities of being in a relationship with Red while grappling with her own insecurities and impending motherhood is a testament to Blair's ability to nail a nuanced performance. Miss, stay away from him for your own safety. He was trying to help, don't you see? I hate it when people stare at me. It makes me feel like a freak. You, my dear, will suffer more than anyone. I'll deal with it. It's almost poetic how Abe Sapien, the aquatic intellectual, finds himself drowning in a tidal wave of emotions in the sequel. For a fish man, he's surprisingly relatable. His infatuation with Princess Nuala isn't just a quirky subplot, it reflects the tale's broader themes. 
Through their bond, we're led to ponder questions about sacrifice, duty, and the age-old conundrum of the heart's treacherous desires. Plus, his Barry Manilow serenade might be comedic gold, but beneath it lies a well of loneliness and a longing for connection. Doug Jones, Hollywood's unsung hero of creature portrayals, manages to capture the essence of a creature torn between two worlds. His mannerisms, the gentle cadence of his voice, and the hint of sadness in his eyes all make Abe's character a deeply empathetic one. Nagthani. Abraham. What the hell are you doing? You would do the exact same for Liz. Agent Sapien, no! Then, as the Angel of Death, Jones portrays an entirely different beast, something ancient, eldritch, and haunting. It's eerie, it's graceful, and it's quintessential Jones. Is this reminiscent of anything else I've done for Guillermo del Toro? I'll give you a hint. As always, Jeffrey Tambor's Manny offers a delightful contrast to the film's fantastical nature. He's the bureaucratic skeptic in a world of monsters, the eye-rolling head honcho who, deep down, has a begrudging affection for Red and his team. Tambor delivers his lines with a sardonic wit and his comedic timing is on point. His interactions, especially with Hellboy, reflect his exacerbation with the high-stress job of being in charge of a questionable bureaucracy, and he seamlessly shifts between comedic relief and the voice of reason. I am medicated. I mean, this is not candy. This is, it's an antacid. You gotta do me a little favor. Tonight, out there, you have to be... Discreet. Well, thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Discreet. Prince Noir is not your run-of-the-mill, power-hungry antagonist. He's a relic of a bygone age, with motives steeped in the tragedies of his people's past. His every move is informed by a deep-seated rage against humanity's encroachments, making him more of a tragic figure, blinded by his convictions. And Luke Goss is a study in contained intensity and regal gravitas, bringing a multi-layered performance that oscillates between malevolence and vulnerability. His regal posture and controlled movements reflect a character that's been steeped in centuries of tradition, anguish, and duty. The balletic fight sequences, the fiery convictions in his belief, and the subtle cracks in his stoic facade make him an understandable and formidable antagonist. What are you waiting for? This is what you wanted, isn't it? Look at it, the last of its kind. You have more in common with us than with them. Kill me. You must, for I will not stop. I cannot. Sorry, pal. You live. On the other hand, Anna Walton's ethereal and enigmatic Princess Nuala, with a gossamer fragility, acts as a foil to her brother's fiery resolve. Bound by the psychic tether they share, she's constantly caught in the crossfire of his destructive path, and Walton brings a graceful form of courage to the role. Her brief but memorable relationship with Abe and ultimate sacrifice truly make her one of the film's emotional anchors. Give me your hand. Johann Krauss, the gas bag in a tin can, is a fascinating study in duality. On one hand, he's the perfect caricature of a German bureaucrat, stringent, methodical, and occasionally insufferable. On the other, he's a soul untethered, trying to enforce order in a world and a body that's anything but orderly. His character arc subtly questions the very nature of identity. What are we without our physical forms? Is he a man, a memory, or just a floating sentiment in a mechanical shell? And Seth MacFarlane brings a unique, playful arrogance to Krauss that's just brilliant. Every line is a delight filled with deadpan humor and a hint of menace, and his exchanges with Red are some of the film's comedic highlights, thanks to MacFarlane's impeccable timing. Mr. Krauss? Sir? Krauss, agent. There's a double S. Yes, sir. Right. You will learn to obey me, follow protocol, and stay focused at all times. Uh, that word, I wouldn't use it then. So we have clearance then. Agent Sherman, Liz, screws a clearance. Johan, they can't do this. Stop them. Dr. Manning, suck my ectoplasmic schwanstocher. The idea for Hellboy 2 was birthed in the imaginative minds of Guillermo del Toro and Mike Manola, who opted to create an original tale rather than adapt story arcs from Manola's comic book series. The thing is with Mike Mignola and Guillermo is that they go back and forth and they just allow themselves to dream. And the two of them have a relationship where their dreams somehow manifest themselves exponentially when they're in the room together. In tandem with the script, Del Toro started working with a team of concept artists to envision the fantastical elements of the narrative. The troll market, in particular, underwent numerous redesigns with Del Toro keen on creating a bustling, immersive, hidden world. We spent three times as much money building sets, so everything has just gotten blown out. It's amazing, the sets in this film. It feels like Gamer wants to see his vision and he wants to be in control of that. I think the set pieces are more varied, the creatures are more varied, they're funnier, the fights are very different one from another. So all in all, there are much more flavors, different flavors in this movie than in the first one. 
The setting is a masterclass in cinematic set design and creature creation, teeming with a life in detail, a busy, chaotic representation of the magical world. Hundreds of creature plans were drawn, modeled, and revised, while every character, from the ornate Golden Army soldiers to the multi-eyed vendor in the market, was given a backstory. I think both Guillermo and I felt with the first Hellboy film that we went a little light with the creatures. Every single image that you see in the film, every single creature that you see sprung from his imagination. A known advocate for practical effects, the director decided that most creatures would be achieved through on-set makeup and prosthetics with minimal reliance on CGI. This required an army of makeup artists and the innovative use of animatronics. It also meant the performers, including Doug Jones, who played multiple roles, had to endure hours in the makeup chair, transforming into their various creatures. So I think the idea was with the prosthetic pieces that they'd slightly manipulate our features to make them similar. Um, and then it just didn't really work out for me. Luke still has his, and, and it sort of came about that it, it didn't really work for me, which I'm quite relieved about, because it's not that pleasant having something stuck on your face and then peeled off every night. There was a couple of scenes in the movie where I have to do, you know, shirtless. And those days were eight hour days. I was getting picked up at 12.15 a.m. to start my work day at 8.30 in the morning. And that's tough, that's demoralizing. We did seven weeks of this. With that said, while Del Toro's preference leaned towards practical effects, there was still a significant amount of CGI work required, especially for the scenes involving the Golden Army and the Elemental Forest God. The shot with the head, the crawling head, I think is the longest animated bit. And that's all hand animated. It's not procedural. It's, you know, an animator going in there and posing it out and making it work. When the elemental has been shot, we have a beat where Hellboy struggles with the idea of killing the last of its kind. We needed a moment of pathos where we as the audience get to see what a great loss it would be. But then you get an effect that I call hitting it on the nose. If you're telling your audience exactly what's going on all of the time, they're never going to get invested. If you provide a little gap for them to try to figure out, they start to invest themselves a little bit more in that performance. The film is primarily shot in Hungary with Budapest's unique architecture and landscapes providing the perfect backdrop for the film's blend of reality and fantasy. Craftsmen, artists and engineers collaborated to bring the vision to life, ensuring functionality while staying true to the fantastical designs. On Hellboy 1, I was self-censoring myself much more than I thought. But after Pants Labyrinth, I said, well, let's lose the hair, let's let the hair loose. And these guys uh, gave me a green light to anything I imagined. Del Toro's longtime collaborator, cinematographer Guillermo Navarro, captures the grandeur and intricacy of the director's vision with a keen eye, ensuring that each visual tells a story, while Danny Elfman's score complements the film's tone, oscillating between moments of wonder, tension, and deep emotion. The brother and the sister, they are literally uh, opposite sides of the coin. The prince and princess represent sort of one person who is divided by their conscience. As much as his sister is very honorable, as is he. You know, he was at war with his father. He wasn't in kindergarten, you know, learning how to put blocks and things. He was on the back of a horse learning how to fight. The prince is essentially the last of a race. The humans are pushing and pushing the magical creatures into the outskirts of society, the underworld. And uh, the prince essentially says, no more. Hellboy 2 offers a mix of witty zingers, mythology, action, and heartfelt moments. There's a certain charm when Red and Abe are drowning their sorrows in liquor, discussing love in the most human way possible. But then, just when you're immersed, you might get a line that pulls you out with its false attempt at levity. The film has its foot on the gas pedal right from the start. The action sequences are grand, particularly Hellboy's face-off with the Elemental and the climactic battle with the Golden Army and Prince Nuado. There's weight, there's grit, and most importantly, there's heart. But the pacing occasionally feels too relentless, sacrificing breathing room for action. And while the action is visually stimulating and expertly choreographed, one might pine for a few moments of quiet introspection amidst the cacophony. I've worked with directors who don't know what they want and so they'll get like a hundred takes hoping to find something that sounds good to them. But he knew exactly what he wanted. He was very relaxed and confident about what he wanted. What I love about Del Toro's filmography and this film in particular is that the director imbues his creatures with a compelling paradox, a human touch in their otherworldly existence. Their ethical dilemma is tangible, their adversarial stance oddly rational. This was always embodied through Red, an advocate for humanity, yet forever an outsider, and a sympathizer to fellow freaks of nature. And the moral complexities find their zenith when Hellboy ultimately questions his role in the BPRD. This culminates with Red, Liz, Abe, and even Krauss abandoning the zero-tolerance approach of the BPRD in favor of carving their own peaceful existence. 
In this way, they honor the sacrifice of Princess Nuala and her father's aim at fostering a coexistence between the species that cannot exist while the team function purely as monster hunters. Everything comes from Mignola. Mignola is the root of all things in Hellboy. And at the end of the day, it is very fortunate that his universe and the universe I love in film intersect so much. Rivaling the flair of its 2004 precursor, Hellboy 2 The Golden Army serves as a gleeful romp through Del Toro's infatuation with strange things that go bump in the night. With its stellar cast, breathtaking visuals, and a story that resonates, the film is a standout in the realm of fantasy cinema, and a testament to the magic that can be achieved when storytelling meets imagination. The depth of his accumulated knowledge based on this voracious curiosity to read everything about why people need to tell stories is what sets him apart from just a guy who's making movies. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll wet your pants. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we cover Hellboy 2 The Golden Army. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and check out the Film Comics Explained podcast on the second channel. And if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Throw me a bone here! Ugh!